Throughout history and across the myths of countless cultures, legendary weapons and artifacts have captivated the imagination of mortals. These are not mere tools of war, they are symbols of power, conduits of the divine, and keys to the mysteries of the universe. From the celestial forges of the gods to the shadowy corners of occult practice, these items have shaped destinies and decided the fates of heroes and nations. Join me as we embark on a journey through time and myth. We'll uncover the secrets of these enigmatic artifacts, from the well-known Excalibur resting in its stone to the enigmatic Philosopher's Stone sought after by alchemists of old. We will explore the mystical significance, the stories that gave birth to their legends, and the profound impact they continue to have on our culture and storytelling. This is not just a history lesson, it's an odyssey into the heart of human belief and creativity. Prepare to delve into the legends of steel and sorcery. Welcome to the mythical arsenal, the armor of God. In the same passage, Paul talks about the full armor of God, which includes the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the readiness of the gospel of peace as shoes for one's feet. These are not physical weapons, but are metaphorical protections against evil. The armor of God, as described by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6, 10 to 18, does not correspond to any physical object, but rather to a set of spiritual defenses that a believer can wear to remain steadfast in spiritual warfare. If depicted, the armor might resemble Roman soldier gear, with each piece symbolically representing a Christian virtue. The belt of truth might look like a sturdy leather girdle, essential for holding other pieces of armor in place. The breastplate of righteousness could be imagined as a polished, impenetrable chest armor. The shield of faith might be a large door-sized shield to extinguish the fiery arrows of the enemy. The helmet of salvation could resemble a protective headgear, often depicted with a crest. The shoes of the gospel of peace might be sturdy sandals, designed for readiness and stability. The concept of the armor of God is rooted in Old Testament imagery, such as in Isaiah 59, 17, where it says that God wears righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. Paul adapts this imagery to fit the spiritual needs of Christians, urging them to put on these virtues to protect against spiritual, not physical, adversaries. The sword of the spirit this term comes from the New Testament, where the Apostle Paul describes the armor of God in his letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians 6, 10, 18. The sword of the Spirit is described as being the Word of God, which is a metaphor for the power of divine scripture. While the sword of the Spirit is a metaphorical weapon and not a physical object, it is often artistically depicted as a double-edged sword which aligns with the biblical description of the Word of God being sharper than any double-edged sword, Hebrews 4 to 12. It would typically be represented as an ancient Roman sword or gladius, known for its double-edged design with a short, pointed blade designed for thrusting. The hilt might be ornate, often with a cross design or inscriptions that represent scripture verses or divine names. The sword of the Spirit is the only offensive weapon listed in the full armor of God, emphasizing the proactive aspect of Christian doctrine, the idea that the Word of God is to be spread actively and serves as a tool to combat falsehood and evil. The key of David, mentioned in the book of Revelation, Revelation 3 to 7, this key is said to open doors that no one can shut and to shut doors that no one can open. It symbolizes authority and power over the kingdom of David, but more broadly, it is about spiritual authority. The key of David is not described in detail in the Bible, 
so its physical appearance is largely a matter of artistic interpretation. However, it is often depicted as an oversized, ornate key, potentially of ancient design reminiscent of keys from the period of King David. It may have Hebrew inscriptions or symbols, such as the Star of David, and be made of gold or another precious metal to signify its importance and divine nature. The Key of David is not just a symbol of authority, but also of knowledge and the ability to unlock and understand divine truths. It's a concept embraced by many theologians and scholars who see it as a metaphor for Christ's authority to grant access to the Kingdom of Heaven. The Rod of Aaron, although not a weapon in the conventional sense, the Rod or Staff of Aaron, which is described in the Old Testament, Exodus 7 to 10, had miraculous powers such as turning into a serpent and causing the first of the ten plagues of Egypt by turning the Nile to blood. The Rod of Aaron is often depicted as a wooden staff that may bear carvings or inscriptions. It is traditionally a medium to dark brown, resembling the natural wood from which it would have been made. It may be shown with budding or flowering branches at the top, referencing the biblical passage where Aaron's rod budded, blossomed, and produced almonds overnight. Numbers 17 to 8, as a sign of his legitimate priesthood. Beyond its biblical miracles, Aaron's rod is also symbolic in later Jewish, Christian, and occult traditions. It represents authority and is sometimes used as a symbol of the priesthood. In Freemasonry, it is one of the emblems of the office of the Master of the Lodge, the Staff of Moses. Similar to Aaron's rod, Moses' staff was used to perform signs and wonders, including parting the Red Sea, which allowed the Israelites to escape from Egypt. The Staff of Moses is typically depicted as a long wooden staff, often shown as rugged and natural, with a curve at the top. It may resemble an aged shepherd's crook, reflecting Moses' time as a shepherd in Midian. It's usually a dark brown color and made to look as if it has been smoothed by time and use. The Staff of Moses is not only a symbol of divine power, but also of leadership. In many ways, it was a tangible representation of Moses' role as the leader of the Israelites. It is also noteworthy that the staff was used in actions that were crucial for the Israelites' survival and liberation, thus embodying the themes of freedom and divine intervention in human affairs. The Seven Seals In the Book of Revelation, the seven seals represent the apocalyptic judgment released upon the world, leading to cataclysmic events. The one who opens them, the Lamb, wields the authority to bring about these events. The seven seals are not described in a physical sense as tangible objects in the book of Revelation. Rather, they are symbolic actions taken by the Lamb, interpreted to be Jesus Christ. However, they are often artistically rendered as ancient scrolls or parchment, each sealed with wax that bears the imprint of a signet ring. These seals could be depicted in various colors, with each one being broken or opened to unleash a different apocalyptic vision. Each of the first four of the seven seals is associated with the horsemen of the apocalypse, representing conquest, war, famine, and death. These figures have deeply influenced Christian eschatology and have been the subject of various artistic interpretations, literature, and pop culture references throughout history. The Urim and Thummim. While not weapons in the traditional sense, these objects were part of the high priest's breastplate and were used for divination or to discern the will of God, which could be seen as a powerful tool or weapon in spiritual battles. The Urim and Thummim are traditionally understood to be a pair of objects kept in the breastplate of a Jewish high priest used for divination purposes. Their exact nature is not described in the biblical texts, 
but they are often thought to be stones or some form of lots. Artistic interpretations typically portray them as two stones with inscriptions possibly fitting into the breastplate settings or held in pouches. The Urim and Thummim are shrouded in mystery as the Bible does not provide a detailed account of their appearance or the precise method by which they were used. Some biblical scholars suggest that they may have been used in a process similar to casting lots to facilitate decision-making for the Israelites. The Stones of Fire In the Talmud and later Jewish mystical texts, there are references to stones or tablets that could be ignited and thrown to protect the Jewish people. This concept might be linked to the Stones of Fire mentioned in the context of the fall of the angelic prince of Tyre in Ezekiel 28, 14, 16. The stones of fire are not described in detail in the biblical or rabbinic texts, leaving their physical characteristics to the imagination. However, based on the mystical tradition, they might be envisioned as precious stones or gem-like objects imbued with a bright inner light or fire that could be kindled under certain conditions, possibly resembling coals that glow with an unearthly flame. The phrase, stones of fire, is interpreted in various ways. In the context of Ezekiel, it is often understood allegorically, referring to the lofty status from which the Prince of Tyre, symbolized by an angelic figure, fell due to his hubris. In Jewish mysticism, these stones may represent divine protection or the fiery nature of divine presence and revelation. The Sword of King David. While not mythical in a supernatural sense, the Sword of the Great King David has taken on a larger-than-life significance in Jewish tradition due to his central role as a warrior king who established Jerusalem as the capital city of Israel. The Sword of King David, while not described in detail in historical texts, would likely be a sword of the period, possibly in Ziphos or an early form of the Spatha, given the era and the region. It would have a straight, double-edged blade, with a simple hilt and possibly adorned with ancient Hebrew inscriptions or symbols signifying David's royal status and divine favor. An interesting aspect of King David's sword is the legend of it being Goliath's sword. After David defeated Goliath with his sling, he took the giant's sword and later retrieved it from the priests in Nob, making it his own. This legendary weapon thus symbolizes David's divine right to rule and his military prowess. Gideon's Trumpet In the book of Judges, Gideon leads a small force of Israelites against a much larger army with the help of unconventional weapons, trumpets and jars. The sound of the trumpets, along with the breaking of jars and the lighting of torches, caused confusion among the enemy, leading to their defeat. Gideon's trumpet would be an ancient shofar, which is a musical horn typically made from a ram's horn. This instrument has a distinctive curve and rough texture with a narrow end where the sound is blown out. The shofar's appearance can vary, with some being quite long and others more compact, depending on the horn it was made from. Gideon's use of the trumpet, along with jars and torches, is a classic example of psychological warfare. The sudden loud noise and the unexpected tactic were key elements in his victory, demonstrating that battles could be won through strategy and cleverness, not just sheer numbers or traditional weapons. The Archangel Michael's Sword. In later Jewish tradition and texts, the Archangel Michael, considered the protector of Israel, is often depicted with a sword that he uses to fight off evil spirits or forces opposed to God's will. The Archangel Michael's Sword is commonly depicted as a magnificent ethereal weapon with a shimmering blade, often radiant or fiery in appearance. The hilt is typically ornate 
befitting the status of an archangel with jewels or inscriptions denoting its divine nature. The grip may be wrapped in a material that glows with heavenly light and the pommel might feature a design symbolic of Michael's role as the leader of God's armies, such as a scale for justice or a cross. In many depictions, especially within Christian art, Michael's sword is not merely a weapon, but also a symbol of the divine judgment that he administers. The Archangel Michael is often shown using his sword to defeat Satan or the dragon, representing the triumph of divine will and good over evil. Zulfikar. The most famous weapon associated with Islamic tradition is the sword Zulfikar, which is said to have been given to Ali ibn Abi Talib, the cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad, during the Battle of Uhud. It is often depicted in Muslim art as a scissor-like double-bladed sword and has come to symbolize divine justice and valor. Zulfikar is traditionally depicted as a sword with a unique split double-tipped blade resembling a pair of scissors. Its design is quite distinct from typical medieval swords, featuring two parallel blades, which emphasize its dual nature. The handle is likely to have been practical and sturdy to suit the needs of a battlefield, possibly adorned with inscriptions from the Quran or sayings, hadiths, of the Prophet Muhammad that praise Ali's valor and rightful leadership. An interesting aspect of Zulfikar is the mystical and symbolic status it has attained. The sword is not just celebrated as a relic of the Prophet's cousin. It has become a symbol of justice, bravery, and the spiritual authority of Ali in Shia Islam. During religious processions and ceremonies, replicas of Zulfikar are often displayed to evoke these qualities and commemorate Ali's role in Islamic history. The Seal of Solomon. In Islamic folklore, Solomon, Suleiman, had a ring that was given to him by God that allowed him to command jinn and spirits and to speak with animals. While it's not a weapon in the conventional sense, it granted Solomon great power and control over the supernatural. The Seal of Solomon, or Solomon's Ring, is typically described as a signet ring made of brass and iron. It was said to bear an intricate symbol, often depicted as a hexagram, which later came to be known as the Star of David, or as a complex seal featuring interlocking triangles symbolizing the union of opposites and the harmony of the cosmos. The seal on the ring was believed to have been engraved with sacred names of God, giving it its power to bind and command the spirits. A fascinating aspect of the Seal of Solomon is its crossover into various cultures and magical traditions. While it is rooted in Islamic law, the symbol has been adopted into Jewish Kabbalistic practices, Christian mystical texts, and Western occultism. It is seen as a powerful amulet that can provide protection, knowledge, and authority over the spiritual world. The Trumpet of Gabriel. Although not a weapon in the conventional sense, the trumpet of Archangel Gabriel is a powerful symbol in both Christianity and Islam. It is said that Gabriel will blow the trumpet to mark the end of time and the resurrection on Judgment Day. The trumpet of Gabriel is typically depicted as a long, radiant horn often with a wide bell and sometimes adorned with jewels or inscriptions. Its length is usually exaggerated to symbolize its divine nature and the vast reach of its sound. In many artistic renditions, it gleams with an otherworldly light or is surrounded by a halo, indicating its sacred purpose. In religious tradition, Gabriel's trumpet has a dual role it is the instrument that will announce the Day of Judgment, but it is also associated with the Annunciation to Mary about the birth of Jesus. This dual symbolism of both an end and a beginning showcases the trumpet's role as a herald of significant divine moments. Fiery chariot and horses. In the Hebrew Bible, 
the prophet Elijah is taken up to heaven by a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which can be interpreted as angelic agents of God's power. The fiery chariot and horses, as described in the Hebrew Bible, particularly in 2 Kings 2.11, are imagined as a magnificent and otherworldly chariot ablaze with divine fire, with flames emanating from every part of it, leaving trails of fire as it moves. The horses are equally fiery, with manes and tails that look like flickering flames. The chariot itself might be golden or appear to be made of light, and the horses are often depicted as being white with glowing red eyes highlighting their celestial nature. The taking of Elijah by the fiery chariot is unique in the Hebrew Bible as it signifies Elijah's ascension to heaven without dying a mortal death, a distinction shared only with Enoch. This event is celebrated in Judaism during the ritual Passover Seder, where a cup of wine is left for Elijah in hope that he will return as a harbinger of the Messiah. Divine Chains. In the book of Revelation, an angel is described as coming down from heaven with the key to the abyss and a great chain to bind the dragon, which is identified as Satan. The Divine Chains mentioned in the book of Revelation, specifically Revelation 21 to 2, are often envisioned as massive luminescent links of an ethereal substance that transcends any earthly material. They may appear to be made of light or fire, with a radiant glow that signifies their heavenly origin. These chains are imagined to be unbreakable, imbued with divine power specifically for the purpose of binding Satan, indicating their supernatural strength and durability. The concept of chaining a supernatural entity like Satan is symbolic of the ultimate triumph of good over evil. In Revelation, the binding of Satan for a thousand years represents a period of peace and divine rule on earth before the final judgment. This imagery has captured the imagination of Christians for centuries as it provides a powerful metaphor for the hope of a future where evil is restrained and righteousness prevails. The Trident. Perhaps the most iconic demonic weapon is the Trident, often associated with Satan or various sea demons. In Christian iconography, the devil is sometimes depicted with a pitchfork-like weapon that is similar to Poseidon's Trident. The demonic Trident typically resembles a pitchfork with three sharp prongs, but it is often depicted with a more sinister aesthetic when associated with diabolical figures. The prongs might be barbed or twisted, and the entire weapon often has a dark, metallic appearance, sometimes adorned with infernal motifs or inscriptions. It may emanate an aura of malevolence or be wreathed in hellish flames, further emphasizing its association with the underworld. While the trident is now commonly associated with the devil in popular culture, its origins as a symbol of power are much older. In various mythologies, tridents are wielded by deities and are symbols of dominion over the sea, like Poseidon in Greek mythology or Shiva in Hinduism, where it symbolizes the trinity of creation, maintenance, and destruction. The adoption of the trident as a diabolical symbol was likely influenced by its association with these ancient gods and the desire of early Christian iconography to distance itself from pagan religions by reinterpreting their symbols. The Sword of Satan In some mythological depictions, Satan is described as wielding a great sword, which symbolizes his role as the adversary and his power to cause destruction. The Sword of Satan In mythological representations is often a grand and terrifying weapon, usually oversized to emphasize its power. It may have a long, black or fiery blade that glows with an unsettling light, or is inscribed with symbols or characters that suggest a nefarious purpose. The hilt might be made of a metal that seems to absorb light rather than reflect it 
adorned with jewels that resemble burning coals, and the grip could be wrapped in a material that seems to shift and move as though alive. The Sword of Satan is not a commonly described artifact in mainstream religious texts. It is more often a product of artistic and literary imagination. Its depiction is designed to represent the antithesis of holy and divine weapons that are said to protect and defend. While swords are common symbols of justice and authority, the sword of Satan turns this on its head, representing perversion of justice and the usurpation of authority. The Lemigaton, or Lesser Key of Solomon. While not a weapon, this grimoire from the 17th century, which is part of a collection known as the Clavicular Salomonis, or Key of Solomon, is said to detail the art of summoning and controlling demons. In a metaphorical sense, knowledge and pacts with demons can be considered weapons that evil forces use to exert their influence. The Lemigaton, or Lesser Key of Solomon, is often depicted as an aged tome with a cover of worn leather, often embossed with arcane symbols and sigils. Its pages might be yellowed with age, filled with elaborate illustrations of demons and detailed instructions in Latin or a cipher script. The book might have clasps and locks made of an antique metal to keep its contents secure, adding to its mysterious and forbidden allure. The Lesser Key of Solomon is divided into five parts, each focusing on a different aspect of demonology and magic. One of the most famous sections is the Ars Goetia, which describes the 72 demons that King Solomon is said to have summoned and confined in a bronze vessel sealed by magical symbols. The Grimoire is a guide for evoking these beings and bargaining with them. Ars Goetia concerns the summoning and commanding of 72 demons. Ars Theogia Goetia deals with spirits of the cardinal points and their subdivisions. Ars Paulina focuses on angels of the hours of the day and night and of the zodiac signs. Ars Almadel involves constructing a wax tablet known as Almadel to summon angels. Ars Notoria contains prayers and orations that promise quick learning and mastery of arts and sciences. The Whip of Fire. In various myths, demons are said to carry whips made of fire or bones, used to torment souls, or as a symbol of their authority in the underworld. The Whip of Fire is typically envisioned as a long, pliable weapon composed of intertwined strands that resemble flowing lava or smoldering embers. The handle might be constructed from blackened bone or charred metal, adorned with demonic iconography or inscriptions in a hellish script. The whip's lashes are often depicted as being alive with flames, flickering and writhing as if each strand were a tendril of fire capable of scalding or searing whatever it touches. In Dante Alighieri's Inferno, part of his epic poem, The Divine Comedy, demons known as Malebranche are described as tormentors of the damned in the eighth circle of hell. They are equipped with hooks and whips to drive the sinners and ensure their punishments. The whip of fire is a common motif in such depictions of hell, symbolizing both the control that demons exert over damned souls and the unrelenting torture that is characteristic of such infernal realms. Cursed objects. Many tales speak of demons attaching themselves to or being bound within certain cursed objects, which can range from books to dolls that cause harm to those who come into contact with them. Cursed objects in folklore and myth can take on many forms, but they often have an ominous and ancient appearance that suggests their malevolent nature. A book, for instance, might be bound in tattered leather with clasps of cold iron and adorned with strange symbols that writhe unsettlingly when observed. A doll could have lifelike glassy eyes that seem to follow onlookers 
and an unnaturally worn texture to its clothing, giving it a disquieting presence. An interesting fact about cursed objects is that they often come with a warning or legend attached to them. Their histories are typically shrouded in tragedy and misfortune, with stories of previous owners suffering dire fates. This reinforces the object's reputation, whether they are indeed cursed by a demon or simply objects of psychological terror due to the power of suggestion and superstition. Poisonous breath or gaze. Some demons are said to kill or incapacitate their victims with poisonous breath or a deadly gaze, acting as a natural weapon of sorts. In mythological depictions, creatures with poisonous breath or a deadly gaze often have exaggerated and terrifying features to accentuate their lethal nature. For instance, a demon with poisonous breath might have elongated, sharp teeth and green or black vapors visibly emanating from its open maw with its face twisted in a malicious grin. For a being with a deadly gaze, the eyes would be the focal point, possibly glowing, unusually colored, or depicted with slits or no pupils at all, indicating its supernatural nature. One of the most famous examples of a creature with a deadly gaze is the Medusa from Greek mythology, whose look could turn people to stone. This motif of a lethal gaze or breath can be interpreted symbolically, reflecting the idea that some beings are so malevolent or their essence so toxic that mere contact with their most basic forms of interaction, looking or breathing, can be deadly. The Death Scythe. Although traditionally associated with the Grim Reaper figure, some narratives describe demons wielding scythes that can reap souls or inflict harm. The Death Scythe is typically portrayed as an elongated, menacing blade attached to a long, dark staff, usually composed of materials that appear ancient and otherworldly. The blade itself may have intricate engravings or runes that glow faintly with a spectral light, hinting at its supernatural abilities. The entire weapon exudes an aura of darkness and foreboding, often depicted with wisps of shadow or cold mist clinging to it, as if it's a bridge between the realms of the living and the dead. While the scythe is a tool originally used for reaping crops, its association with death likely comes from the metaphor of harvesting souls like one would harvest grain. This image has been personified by the Grim Reaper or death in many cultures and has been carried over into popular culture to signify the presence of death or the act of dying. In some stories and depictions, the scythe could cut through the very essence of life, separating the soul from the body. Hellfire. In many religious and mythological stories, demons have the ability to control or use hellfire, a supernatural and inextinguishable fire from the underworld, to punish the damned or battle angels. Hellfire is often depicted as a flame that burns with an unnatural color, such as a deep, menacing red, an eerie blue, or even a sickly green, indicating its supernatural and malevolent origin. The flames may appear to move with purpose and intent, as if alive, and might be immune to water or other traditional methods of extinguishing fire. Hellfire could also be shown emitting from a demon's hands or mouth, or as a weaponized form, such as a ball of fire or a fiery weapon. The concept of hellfire is fascinating, because it often represents more than just physical destruction. It's a symbol of eternal torment and spiritual ruin. In many religious texts, hellfire is described as having the power to not only consume the flesh, but also to afflict the soul, making it a particularly feared element in mythological stories and religious warnings. The Cauldron of Rebirth. In Celtic mythology, this cauldron owned by a demon or dark god could bring the dead back to life, often as soulless or demonic beings bent on war and destruction. The cauldron of rebirth is typically depicted as a large ancient vessel 
often with ornate Celtic designs and symbols. It may have an iron or dark stone appearance with a wide brim and three solid legs holding it off the ground. Sometimes it's shown with a mysterious liquid bubbling within, casting an eerie light that suggests its magical properties. The cauldron might also emit a ghostly vapor or have otherworldly flames licking its sides, emphasizing its connection to life, death, and rebirth. The Cauldron of Rebirth is akin to the Cauldron of Dagda from Irish mythology and also shares similarities with the concept of the Holy Grail. It embodies the cycle of life, death, and rebirth, a central theme in many mythologies. This cauldron's power to reanimate the dead often comes with the caveat that those resurrected lose something essential, like their soul or their former selves, emphasizing the theme that some forms of knowledge or power come with dire consequences. Sudarshana Chakra, the spinning disc-like weapon of Lord Vishnu, which can be used to cut down all evil. It is said to have the power to destroy anything in its path and then return to the thrower, similar to a boomerang. The Sudarshana Chakra is traditionally depicted as a brilliant circular discus with a sharp, serrated edge that glows with an inner light, symbolizing its divine nature. It is often shown with a fiery rim, and in the center there might be a symbolic representation such as a lotus or an om sign, which denotes its connection to Lord Vishnu. The chakra is illustrated in art as spinning rapidly, emanating rays of light that cut through darkness and ignorance. The Sudarshana chakra is unique among divine weapons in Hindu mythology because it is sentient and can act independently according to Vishnu's will. It is considered to be the most powerful weapon and is invoked in many stories to protect the Dharma, cosmic law and order, and to vanquish demons and obstacles that stand against it. Trishula, Trident, the weapon of Lord Shiva, a trident that represents the three qualities of nature, creation, maintenance, and destruction. It is believed to be one of the most powerful weapons in Hindu mythology. The Trishula is usually depicted as a trident with three prongs, each representing the three gunas, qualities of sattva, rajas, and tamas, symbolizing balance within the universe as well as within the self. The central prong is often the longest, and the weapon can either be simple and elegant or ornate, embellished with various symbols like Om, the Damaru, Shiva's drum, or a crescent moon. It is typically made to look like it is composed of an ancient, indestructible metal, sometimes with a bluish or silvery sheen that reflects its divine nature. The Trishula is not just a weapon, but a symbol of Shiva's power to destroy evil and ignorance. It also has a deeper spiritual meaning, representing the three aspects of consciousness, waking, dreaming, and sleeping, and Shiva's control over these states. The Trishula is sometimes also interpreted as a symbol of the past, present, and future. Pashupatastra, another weapon of Shiva, it is an irresistible and most destructive personal weapon of Shiva and Kali, discharged by the mind, the eyes, words, or a bow. It is capable of destroying creation and vanquishing all beings. The Pashupatastra is rarely depicted in physical form because it is a mantra-based weapon invoked through meditation and mental focus or a divine chant, rather than a tangible weapon that one might hold. However, when it is represented visually, it's often as a bright, radiant light or as a beam emanating from Shiva's third eye, symbolizing the focus and power of consciousness. It can also be shown as an arrow when discharged from a bow symbolizing its targeted and unstoppable force. One of the most intriguing aspects of the Pashupatastra is its selective destructive power, which, according to legends, 
can annihilate the creation, but is also precise and can be directed to destroy specific targets without causing collateral damage. It is also said that the Pashupatastra must be obtained directly from Shiva as he bestows it upon a worthy individual with a caution on the dire consequences if misused. Brahmastra, a weapon created by Brahma. It is described as a very destructive missile that can cause widespread destruction, akin to a nuclear weapon. It is a weapon of last resort and was never to be used in combat lightly. The Brahmastra is often depicted in Hindu texts as a fiery weapon, typically represented as a missile or an arrow enveloped in flames and radiance, and sometimes adorned with ancient Sanskrit syllables. When illustrated, it is shown as being launched with a bull, trailing a blaze of destructive energy that threatens to consume whatever lies in its path. The head of the Brahmastra might be designed intricately, signifying its divine origin and immense power. The Brahmastra is considered one of the most destructive and fearsome weapons in Hindu mythology, and it's believed that its impact area could not be repopulated by life for a lengthy period, hinting at a lasting radiological effect similar to that of a nuclear fallout. Furthermore, it is said that the Brahmastra could only be neutralized by another Brahmastra or by Brahmashirsha Astra, an even more powerful weapon. Gandiva, the bow of Arjuna, one of the Pandavas in the Mahabharata, which was created by Brahma. This bow was known for its immense strength and the power it would confer upon its wielder. Gandiva is traditionally depicted as a large and majestic bow, often shining with a luster that indicates its divine origin. It is described as being exceptionally tall, sometimes as tall as the wielder, and is made of dark wood or sometimes even celestial or elemental materials that shimmer with otherworldly hues. The bowstring is said to hum like a storm or a swarm of bees when plucked, hinting at its latent power. Gandiva may be adorned with gold and inlaid with precious gems, and the hand grip is often wrapped in red or gold cloth, suggesting its regal status. One of the most notable features of Gandiva is that it could not be broken by any ordinary means and was said to provide an inexhaustible number of arrows to its wielder. The bow is also closely linked with the identity of its primary user, Arjuna, and was a gift to him from the fire god Agni. The bow's presence on the battlefield of Kurukshetra during the Mahabharata war was enough to intimidate Arjuna's enemies. Vajra, the thunderbolt weapon of Indra, king of the Devas, gods, it is considered one of the most powerful weapons in Hindu mythology, made from the bones of the sage Dadichi and was used to kill the demon Vritra. The Vajra is usually depicted as a stout, ribbed, cylindrical weapon that expands at the ends, having the appearance of a short, thick, double-sided club or mace. It is often shown with four to eight prongs emanating from each end, resembling the petals of a lotus. The central part is sometimes wrapped with a grip, and it is often gold in color, radiating light or fire. The weapon's design may also incorporate diamonds or other gems, reflecting its indestructible nature, since Vajra is the Sanskrit word for diamond. The Vajra is not only a symbol of destructive force, but also a spiritual emblem. It embodies the properties of a diamond, indestructibility, and a thunderbolt, irresistible force, and thus it signifies firmness of spirit and spiritual power. The weapon's origin story, involving the self-sacrifice of sage Dadhichi so that his bones could be used to create the weapon, emphasizes themes of sacrifice and the materialization of spiritual power. Nandaka, the sword of Vishnu, which is considered a personification of his power of destruction. Nandaka, the sword of Vishnu, is often portrayed as a splendid and radiant weapon 
that symbolizes knowledge and the eradication of ignorance. It is depicted with a straight, double-edged blade that might be flowering towards the tip, often resembling the traditional Indian kanda or tulwar in shape. The sword is usually embellished with intricate e signs and sometimes inscriptions of sacred mantras. The hilt is likely to be ornate, fitting for the status of Vishnu, and could be studded with precious stones or wrapped in divine cloth. Sometimes Nandaka is also illustrated with a blue glow, matching Vishnu's complexion, signifying its divine origin. Nandaka is not just a physical weapon, but also a symbol of the intellectual and spiritual acuity required to dispel ignorance and conquer evil. It stands for the power of discrimination, the ability to discern right from wrong, and is often considered an allegory for the sharpness of intellect that cuts through the darkness of ignorance. Sharanga, the celestial bow of Vishnu, often depicted in his avatar as Rama or Krishna. Sharanga, the bow attributed to Vishnu and his incarnations such as Rama and Krishna, is usually illustrated as a mighty and magnificent bow, radiant and powerful. This celestial weapon is often shown with an intricate design, likely featuring divine motifs and symbols associated with Vishnu, such as the conch, lotus, or discus. The bow's limbs could be crafted to resemble the scales of the cosmic serpent, Adisesha, on which Vishnu reclines, or may have patterns evoking the vastness of the cosmos, signifying its heavenly origins. The bowstring is depicted as being capable of withstanding the immense divine force of Vishnu's power. Sharanga is a weapon that symbolizes Vishnu's role as the protector of the universe and the maintainer of cosmic order, Dharma. It is a bow that is said to possess the force to defeat all evil and is thus not merely a battle implement, but also a cosmic instrument that plays a part in the preservation of the world and the balance between good and evil. Kamodaki, the mace of Vishnu, which symbolizes the power of knowledge and strength and is used to crush injustice. Kamodaki, the mace of the Hindu god Vishnu, is typically depicted as a stout and hefty war club that radiates with divine might. It often has a spherical head that might be embossed with symbols of Vishnu, such as the conch or lotus. The mace is usually shown with a glowing aura, signifying its sacred nature. The grip could be ornately wrapped, providing a contrast with the destructive power of its head, which is crafted to deliver devastating blows against the forces of evil and ignorance. In depictions of Vishnu, Kaumodaki is not only a weapon of combat, but also a symbol of the divine power that crushes ignorance, much like a thunderbolt that shatters mountains. It represents the mental and spiritual strength that is necessary to overcome adversity and uphold Dharma, cosmic order. Its presence alongside Vishnu is a reminder of the destruction of false knowledge and the importance of true wisdom. Brahmadanda, a counter weapon that defended against the Brahmastra, it represented the highest knowledge of Brahman and could nullify any other weapon. The Brahmadanda is less often depicted in artwork than weapons like the Brahmastra, but it can be conceptualized as an ornate staff or wand, said to embody the ultimate reality, Brahman, from which it derives its name. This staff, when visualized, might be seen as emitting a glow or aura of tranquility and supreme authority, often adorned with Vedic symbols and possibly inscribed with sacred mantras. The staff is both a symbol and an instrument of divine knowledge, which is the ultimate counter to all aggression and material weapons. The Brahmadanda is unique in Hindu mythology as it is not a weapon in the conventional sense. It doesn't inflict damage, but neutralizes the deadliest of weapons, the Brahmastra. Its power lies in its embodiment 
of the ultimate truth and knowledge, which is the essence of the universe and the source of all divine power in Hindu philosophy. It's a testament to the principle that knowledge and truth hold the power to overcome any force. Vimanas are mythological flying palaces or chariots described in ancient Hindu scriptures and Sanskrit epics such as the Ramayana and Mahabharata, as well as other early Indian texts. Vimanas are often described as variously shaped airborne vehicles, from chariot-like structures to more temple-like floating palaces. They are said to be crafted from materials that had a natural luminosity or radiance. Depending on the text, a Vimana could resemble a large, elaborate aerial car with multiple levels and windows emitting soft lights adorned with precious gems and metals that reflect the sky and the sun. In some accounts, they appear as streamlined, bird-shaped vehicles with wings and sometimes with otherworldly propulsion mechanisms. The descriptions of Vimanas are notably advanced and complex, with some texts attributing them with capabilities akin to modern aircraft or even beyond, such as controlled navigation in any direction and stealth technology. The notion of Vimanas has sparked interest in ancient astronaut theories, where some people speculate that these mythological vehicles were either inspired by or were actual visitations from extraterrestrials. Manjushri's sword. Manjushri, the bodhisattva of wisdom, carries a flaming sword that cuts through ignorance and delusion. It represents the sharpness of prajna, or wisdom, which can cut through the veil of ignorance. Physical description, Manjushri's sword, also known as the sword of wisdom, is traditionally depicted as an exquisite and radiant blade, often on fire or surrounded by flames, signifying its ability to illuminate and dispel darkness. The sword is usually double-edged, symbolizing the piercing nature of insight, and the hilt is intricately designed, sometimes with a lotus or a lion, which are symbols associated with Manjushri, representing the blossoming of wisdom and the courage it takes to cut through ignorance. Interesting fact, the sword's flame is not destructive, but rather illuminative, burning away ignorance rather than causing harm. In iconography, Manjushri is often shown wielding the sword in his right hand, while his left hand holds the Prajnaparamita Sutra, the Book of Transcendent Wisdom, indicating the unity of wisdom and compassionate action. Kadga, a type of celestial sword that appears in Buddhist iconography, often carried by Dharma protectors and wrathful deities, symbolizing the cutting away of delusional thoughts. The Kadga is typically depicted as a heavy broadsword with a wide curved blade tapering to a sharp point. The design often incorporates a Vajra at the crossguard, representing indestructible truth, while the handle may be adorned with precious stones or symbols associated with Buddhist teachings. The blade itself can be shown with Sanskrit inscriptions or mantras, suggesting its divine nature and the spiritual authority to cut through ignorance. In Buddhist iconography, particularly within Tibetan Buddhism, the Kadga is sometimes seen in the hands of fierce protector deities known as Dharmapalas or in depictions of wrathful manifestations of bodhisattvas. It is a symbol of the active effort required to overcome obstacles and negative forces on the path to enlightenment. The act of wielding the Kadga against delusions is a metaphor for the practitioner's meditation practice, which aims to sever the roots of suffering and attachment. Pasa, lasso. Often held by bodhisattvas and deities, the lasso is used to bind and remove obstacles, representing the binding of harmful influences and distractions. The pasa, or the lasso, in Buddhist iconography, is usually depicted as a looped rope or cord, often with a long, flowing end 
that spirals outward. The rope is sometimes made to look like it's made of light or energy, indicating its non-physical, spiritual nature. The lasso may be held by deities or bodhisattvas who wield it delicately, ready to ensnare and bind negative forces or influences, symbolizing the containment and control over these harmful elements. In Vajrayana Buddhism, the lasso is an instrument that symbolizes the method aspect of the path, which works together with the wisdom aspect, often symbolized by the Vajra or sword to achieve enlightenment. It's not only a tool to bind negative emotions or energies, but also to draw beings toward enlightenment, showing the compassionate action of the bodhisattvas and deities who wish to free all sentient beings from suffering. Ferba, Ritual Dagger. The Ferba is a ritual dagger used in Tibetan Buddhism to symbolize the slaying or subjugation of negative forces. The blade of the Ferba is used in ceremonies to pin down negative energies and to establish a protective perimeter. The Ferba, also known as Kakla in Sanskrit, typically features a three-sided blade which represents its ability to transform the three poisons in Buddhist belief, ignorance, desire, and hatred into wisdom. The handle often depicts a deity's head or a wrathful figure, such as Vairakileya, symbolizing the dagger's power to overcome obstacles. The Phoebus blade is sometimes depicted as piercing a demon, which represents conquering the demon of ego. The entire dagger is often ornately decorated with intricate carvings and sometimes semi-precious stones or metals. Although it has the shape of a dagger, the ferba is never used as a physical weapon. It is purely a ritual object, symbolically used in Vajrayana Buddhism to bind and pin down negative forces and energies. Its use is grounded in the idea that demons and negative energies can be tamed and transformed into protective allies. Excalibur, Kaladvulch. Probably the most famous Celtic sword, Excalibur, is the legendary sword of King Arthur, said to have magical powers. It was sometimes attributed with the power to blind Arthur's enemies with its brilliance, and its scabbard was said to protect him from losing blood in battle. Excalibur, also known as Kaladfulch in Welsh tradition, is often depicted as a majestic medieval sword with an ornate hilt adorned with precious stones and inscriptions of mystical or royal significance. The blade is typically described as flawless, gleaming with an almost unnatural shine, reflecting its magical origins and properties. The scabbard is equally ornate, often described as adorned with jewels and crafted from materials that would prevent the wearer's wounds. An interesting aspect of Excalibur is the legend of how Arthur obtained it. There are two primary tales, one where he pulls it from the stone, proving his right to rule, and another where he receives it from the Lady of the Lake, symbolizing his receipt of divine kingship. Additionally, the sword's return to the lake upon his death implies the cyclical nature of his reign and the enduring hope for his return as the once and future king. Clayom Soleil, Sword of Light. In Irish mythology, this is one of the four treasures of the Tuatha de Danann and is described as a sword that none could escape from once it was drawn from its sheath and no one could resist. The Clayom Soleil, or Sword of Light, is a mythical Celtic weapon often depicted with an ethereal and radiant quality. Its blade would be crafted to represent unblemished perfection, shining with an inner light that seems to pierce through any darkness. The hilt might be adorned with symbols of the Tuatha de Danann, such as intertwined Celtic knots and ancient Ogham script, with possibly a large gemstone embedded in the pommel emitting a light of its own. A distinctive feature of the Clayomar Soleil is its purported indefatigability 
and the fact that no one could survive its blow. Thus, it is also known as the Sword of Victory. This sword, like many mythical weapons, symbolizes the divine right and power, being one of the treasures that signify the authority of the Tuatha de Danann over Ireland. Spear of Lu, Luin of Chelchar, the spear of the god Lu, one of the Tuatha de Danann, which was said to be unstoppable once it was thrown and would always find its mark. It also needed to be kept in a pot of water when not in use to keep it from igniting, such was its fierce desire for battle. The Spear of Lu, also known as the Luin of Kelchar, is described as an imposing weapon, burning with an unquenchable fire of warfare. Its shaft might be decorated with intricate gold or bronze filigree, suggesting its divine craftsmanship. The head of the spear, crafted from an otherworldly metal, would radiate an intense heat, its edges seemingly blurred with the constant readiness to burst into flame. A container, perhaps a large, ornate cauldron or pot, would stand beside it, filled with water to cool the spear's ardor. The Spear of Lug is one of the hallmark weapons of Irish mythology Noted for its ferocity in battle, it was so bloodthirsty that it would often try to fight on its own accord. The need to submerge it in water to prevent it from igniting reflects its deep association with fire and the intensity of battle, making it not just a weapon but a symbol of unbridled martial power. Gai Bulg, Spear of Kuchulan the Spear of the Hero. Kuchulun, it was made from the bone of a sea monster and had to be deployed from the fork of the toes. It had barbs that would open inside its victim, making the weapon lethal and irremovable. The Gai Bulg, Kuchulun's spear, would likely have a rough and primal appearance, reflecting its origin from the bones of a sea monster. The shaft, might resemble an oversized fish spine, whitish in color, with a texture that hinted at its aquatic heritage. The head of the spear would be even more fearsome, with numerous barbs designed to bloom open upon entry, ensuring a fatal wound. The barbs could be imagined as resembling the teeth or spines of a sea creature, arranged in a terrifying, almost flower-like pattern when deployed. The Gai Bulg required a unique method of deployment. It had to be cast from the foot, typically the fork of the toes. This unusual requirement adds to the mythical status of the weapon and reflects Kuchulin's extraordinary warrior skills. The Gai Bulg's barbs, which would spread through the body of its target, made it one of the most fearsome weapons in Irish mythology, embodying the gruesome and unforgiving nature of mythic warfare. Sword of Nuada, claim Solais. The first king of the Tuatha de Danann, Nuada, had a sword that could cut his enemies in half with a single stroke and was irresistible in battle. The Sword of Nuada, known as the claim Solais, might be envisioned as an exquisitely crafted weapon glowing with an inner light, making it appear as if forged from a shard of the sun. Its blade would be flawless and impossibly sharp, gleaming with a brilliance that no darkness could diminish. The hilt could be ornate, possibly inlaid with gold and precious stones, symbolizing its regal status as the sword of a king. The craftsmanship would be of such a level that the sword would seem to be alive with its own will and intent, almost eager for battle. In mythology, the Sword of Nuada is one of the four legendary treasures of the Tuatha de Danann, brought from their city of Falias to Ireland. It held the power to slay an entire army. It could cut through any shield or armor and was considered one of the most formidable weapons in Irish lore. The Climsolais translates to Sword of Light, 
and it is often portrayed as a symbol of rightful sovereignty and invincibility in battle. Dagda's cauldron and club. Although not weapons in the traditional sense, the Dagda, the chief god, owned a cauldron that was inexhaustible and could feed any number of men, and a club that could kill with one end and bring the dead to life with the other. Dagda's cauldron, often termed the cauldron of plenty, would likely appear as an enormous, deep vessel, perhaps with intricate designs symbolizing abundance and sustenance. It might have an otherworldly glow to indicate its magical nature, suggesting that no matter how much is taken out, it remains ever full. Dagda's club, on the other hand, could be a massive, hefty object, seemingly too large for a normal human to wield. One end of the club might be wrought with symbols of death, such as skulls or dark omens, while the other end could bear motifs of life, such as leaves, branches, or the ankh symbol. The club could have a rugged, ancient look with a sense of immense power contained within its gnarled wood. The Dagda is a father figure god in Irish mythology and is associated with fertility, agriculture, manliness, and strength, as well as magic, druidry, and wisdom. His cauldron was named Undri and was said to be a source of endless food and sustenance, a symbol of hospitality and abundance. The club, known in Irish as the Log Moor or Log Anfa, was so large that it required a wheel and had to be dragged. It had the power to slay nine men with a single blow on one end, but with the other, it could restore life to the dead. Stone of Fal, Leah File. Again, not a weapon, but one of the four treasures of the Tuatha de Danann brought to Ireland. It was a stone that would roar when the true king of Ireland stood upon it. The Stone of Fal, also known as the Leah File, is traditionally depicted as a large standing stone, often phallic in shape, which was common for ancient standing stones in Ireland. It might be adorned with ancient Ogham script or other forms of Celtic symbolism, possibly with worn inscriptions due to its age. The stone would likely have an imposing presence standing on the mythical Hill of Tara, where the High Kings of Ireland were crowned and may be imagined to glow or resonate with a mystical light or sound when activated by the rightful king. The Stone of Fowl is steeped in legend. It's said to be magical, bestowing legitimacy and sovereignty to those who were meant to rule. Its roar was a sign of endorsement, signaling the coronation of a new king. According to myth, the stone was brought to Ireland by the Tuatha de Danann, a supernatural race in Irish mythology who represent the main deities of pre-Christian Gaelic Ireland. The Lea Fail is one of the four legendary treasures they brought with them, including the aforementioned Sword of Nuada and Spear of Lug. As we reach the end of the first chapter in our journey through the annals of myth and legend, we pause to reflect on the stories that have crossed the boundaries of time to whisper to us the secrets of power, wisdom, and mystery. We've delved into the sagas of gods and heroes, unraveling the threads of ancient lore that bind humanity to a past both wondrous and enigmatic. From the flaming sword of Manjushri to the divine seals of Solomon, we've only begun to scratch the surface of the world's legendary armaments. Stay with us as Mystery Files Incorporated continues to explore the depths of mankind's greatest legendary weapons and talismans in part two. What truths lie hidden in their tales? What power do they hold over the collective conscience of civilizations across the globe? Subscribe and join us next time as we unearth more enigmas and continue to piece together the vast puzzle of our past. Until then, 
keep the fires of curiosity alight and prepare for the revelations that await in the concluding part of our epic documentary. This is Mystery Files Incorporated signing off from part one. May your quest for knowledge be as enduring as the legends we explore. Farewell until the story unfolds anew.